Hey, my name is Scott, and today I want to start with a passage of scripture. We're continuing our series called What Would Jesus Undo? as we go through the Sermon on the Mount and look at his teachings there. And so today we're in Matthew 5, verse 38 to 42, where Jesus said, You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You know, every once in a while, I take out a giant like classic novel from the library. I'll feel a little bit of inspiration or something will have uh, put me on to a certain novel and I will go out and I'll take out The Count of Monte Cristo or, uh, I don't know, Moby Dick or something. And I go and I take one of these books out and I think that I'm going to read it. I think, you know what, I've got all this inspiration. Uh, last summer it was the biography of Alexander Hamilton that like the musical was based off of. It's like this giant 800 page book. And I think, you know what, I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to read this classic book so I can say like, I've actually read this. And inevitably I, I maybe finish one chapter. I, uh, I, I get into the second chapter and then I, I either get bored, I lose my inspiration, or I think this book is hard to read. And it's going to take me forever. And then I kind of stop. But interestingly enough, a theme in The Count of Monte Cristo and Moby Dick, both books that I have tried and failed to read, is that there are these really popular revenge stories. What I actually do consume is popular movies. A little easier to uh, digest. And some of the most popular films ever, thinking like Avengers Endgame, the Avatar movies, the Lion King, there are these elements of revenge in them where something has been done against the good guys and the bad guys have to pay. And the good guys go out and get their revenge. And something in us really likes these stories. We think it's so satisfying, it kind of closes the loop. Justice is done. But Jesus seems to say in this passage, don't fight back. Don't get revenge. But I, I think that it's not that hard to think of situations where it's really difficult to think like, how can I not get revenge? How can I not strike back? Or how am I supposed to live out Jesus' words in this situation and turn the other cheek? How am I supposed to do that? And just briefly thinking of a few examples, think of things like self-defense. If somebody comes at you and is, is going to hit you, should you not try to get out of the way? If somebody is an abuser, do we just stand there and just allow them to carry on? If we are protecting another person, do we just say, hey, you know what? I I'm supposed to just turn the other cheek. I'm supposed to ignore this. If we see that there is a group of people who are being oppressed by a greater power, are we just supposed to stand there? I, I think that the people in the crowd would have been really confused when Jesus was saying this as they were people who were ruled by an oppressive Roman government. I don't think that this would have landed softly on their ears. I, I think this would have provoked people. This would have really bothered them. And they would have gone, how am I supposed to live that out? And I think with all of these examples, like surely Jesus can't want us to just stand by and just take whatever comes to us. And I think that there's some element of the agenda of being a follower of Jesus where we're supposed to combat evil in this world. We're supposed to join him in this work of making the world more like the kingdom of God where evil has no place. 
And he, but he has said, do not resist an evil person. But I think that there's a little more nuance to this that is easy to miss if you're just reading this passage. Because I don't think that Jesus meant that evil must never be resisted. He did this in his time on earth. You know, he, he cast out demons. He, he went into the temple. He overthrew tables in the temple. But in these cases, nobody personally or physically did anything towards Jesus. They did at some points. But in both of those examples, that's Jesus ridding an evil system, an evil spirit in the world and just getting rid of it. So you can see how this is a little confusing. There's, there's a little bit of nuance in this passage. How do we combat evil in the world? yet never seek what we would call justice? How do we combat evil in the world, but turn the other cheek? Well, first I think we have to look at exactly what Jesus is undoing. The theme throughout the last few weeks is that there has been bad teachings by one particular group. You might know it's the Pharisees who have twisted all kinds of laws in the Old Testament. See what they had done in this passage was they had taken an Old Testament law that said eye for eye, tooth for tooth. And how this was supposed to be interpreted was if someone does something wrong against you, you can only do up to what they did wrong against you to seek justice. So if they have gouged out your eye, all that you may do, the, the most that you may do is do the same to them. If they have hit you and knocked your tooth out, the most that you can do in return is hit them and knock their tooth out. It's trying to prevent imbalances in the law. But what the Pharisees had done was they had turned this into an obligation in revenge. And they were saying like, hey, if somebody knocks your tooth out, you better knock their tooth out. If somebody messes up your eye, you better mess their eye up. See, the old way, one scholar said it, this way, kind of to paraphrase, they said, the old said, insist on your own right, love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. And so secure your safety, make your little bubble in this world. But what Jesus was saying was to suffer wrong and lavish your love on all. Do not seek revenge, be willing to suffer wrongly and let love win in your life. Another scholar, John Stott, he said about this passage that nowhere is the sermon greater. Nowhere is the distinctness of the Christian counterculture more obvious. And nowhere is our need of the Holy Spirit, whose first fruit is love, more compelling. This is not, a diff this is not an easy passage to live out. Jesus is setting something up that's so obviously counter to the culture. He's making his own set of rules. And he knows that we are definitely going to need the Holy Spirit to help us live this out. So what is Jesus doing? In this world, he is setting up kingdom values. He's setting up his kingdom to reign here on earth. He's showing us how to live in the kingdom of God. He's saying, you know what? You've had all of these rules. Here's some better ones. Here's ones that will actually help you to live more like me. And number two, he's fulfilling the law to go right along with that. He's, he's saying it's no longer that you don't do bad things. It's no longer that we have a bare minimum of justice. I'm actually calling you to something greater. I want you to do good things. I want you to be forces of good in this world. I want you to stop the chain of evil and I want you to turn the other cheek. I want you to go the extra mile. Because he knew this, that evil plus evil only creates more evil. A system of revenge, a system of uh, just basic justice doesn't really work. It just perpetuates evil. If somebody knocks your tooth out and you knock their tooth out, have you done anything better than them? No, you've just gone to their level and you have poured out more of that same evil in this world. 
Evil loves to have a little bit of resistance so that it can continue to fight, so that it can continue to perpetrate in people's lives. You might describe it like this from another book that I actually own, but I haven't read, but I thought, hey, that's a classic. I should buy that. Uh, the Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. There's a character named Buck who says to Huckleberry Finn this quote. Well, a feud is this way. A man has a quarrel with another man and kills him. Then that other man's brother kills him. Then the other brothers on both sides goes for one another. Then the cousins chip in and by and by everybody's killed off and there ain't no more feud. This is how evil perpetuates. It's people seeking vengeance, people seeking their own system of justice. Evil loves to feed off of more evil, but it does not know what to do when met with goodness. And I'm not going to lie, there might be some situations where you feel like, I've tried to be good, and evil kept going, evil kept trying to take advantage of me. And I want to be really sympathetic that some of us may just be caught up with bad people. And I know that something like this isn't necessarily easy to live out, but I, I do believe that Jesus is trying to show us a way to, uh, to overcome this evil. He, I, I believe he's showing us a way to fight off evil with good. Because not seeking revenge requires us to be loving yet wise. We have to let love lead the way. But he also is very clear that we need to be very wise in this world. So some have taken the scripture too far and they've said never hurt anyone, never do anything against anyone. Another very famous author who I have not read, he famously interpreted this passage to go so far as to say that we should never ever seek justice. Just whatever comes your way, let it, let it be, let it happen. But I don't think that's right because we even see examples of Jesus' most intimate followers, the apostles, they stood up for themselves and they showed themselves blameless at times. But the apostles understood what Jesus had taught them when he sent them out in Matthew 10, 16. And he said, look, I am sending you out as sheep among wolves. So be as shrewd as snakes and harmless as doves. Jesus knew a sheep among wolves has no chance. Uh, for a sheep to survive among wolves, it would have to be very, very crafty. And it would have to not provoke any of the wolves. And Jesus displays how we can live out this teaching so beautifully with these three examples. He says, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. Which kind of sounds like if you're going to get hit once, you may as well get hit twice. But there's, there's something a little bit deeper once you go into the context. So let's say somebody with their right hand is going to slap you on their right cheek. If, if they're going to do that, they're going to have to slap you with the back of their hand. Which in those days was like the greatest insult that you could give towards someone. If you can think of like the most derogatory, most, uh, most shame inducing thing that somebody could do to you today, that's kind of what the equivalent was. It was saying like, you're worthless. The most offensive thing that they could do was to slap you with the back of their hand. And Jesus is saying, you know what? If somebody does that, give them the other cheek. Put them in a compromising position. Make them say, make them like look at their actions. Because now are they going to insult you more than anything else and then punch you in the face as well? Give them a choice. Put them in a position where they have to really think about what's happening in this situation. This next example, if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. So the most expensive thing that people in, Israelite, in Israel owned was their coats. We understand this if we live in Winnipeg. We have to buy parkas that, that really actually keep us warm. So you have your outer layer, your coat, and people could sue you for the layer underneath, your, your shirt or like a tunic. 
This is kind of your base layer, but your coat, this was important to you because it was the most expensive item you owned and often people actually used this as their blanket at night. They would take their coat off and they would sleep under it. It was kind of the, the thickest, warmest, most expensive thing they had. And so it was actually illegal to sue somebody for their coat because what you were basically doing if you did that was you were saying, you know what, you might have to freeze to death because I want that coat that you have. And so if you don't have your blanket at night, you might have frozen to death in some of the colder winters in Israel. So they had made it illegal to do that. So if somebody sues you and takes your shirt and you hand it over your coat as well, not only are you now not really wearing anything, but you've put them in a compromising position where they're being handed something that they are not able to take from you. And you're giving them a choice. You are overcoming their evil with, with good. You are doing more than they expect. You're kind of going the extra mile, which goes into this next example. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. So this was part of their way of life is, like I said, they were Israelites living under the reign of Roman occupation. And they had Roman soldiers who would be in and among them kind of doing patrol. And if they were carrying something really heavy, if they had kind of a heavy pack with them, at any time, a Roman superior officer could look at you, an Israelite, and say, hey, you, take this with me. I'm going this way. Carry this for me. And you had to go with them as far as one mile. Now, you can imagine, if you're out doing errands, going to, I don't know, go to work, and maybe you're going east and a Roman officer spots you and says, hey, carry this with me, I'm going west. And now you're forced to walk one mile with them, carrying their things. Can you imagine how bitter you would be towards them? How frustrated you would be? And Jesus is saying, you know what though? Don't be bitter, carry that with joy. And be willing to go two miles with them and put them in a compromising position because they were not allowed to make you carry something two miles for them. One mile was the maximum that they could make you carry it. So if you keep walking, all of a sudden they're going, whoa, 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 slow down, stop, 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 I need that back. Like, what are you doing? You're putting them in a compromising position. Each of these times, Jesus, he's not just saying like, lay over, just be passive, do nothing. He's saying, be wise, be crafty, think about what you're doing. Love people more than they expect them to. Shock people with how good you're going to be. I grew up with two older siblings. And sometimes, as the youngest, uh, we, we kind of get put under the authority of more than just our parents. Because sometimes our parents go away and all of a sudden we're being babysat by our older siblings. And some of those times, my brothers would ask me to do things. And it's like, I don't even like doing it when my parents ask me, but there's no way I'm going to do something because you asked me to do it. You're not the boss of me. And can, can you imagine how much it might have shocked them for their younger brother to go, oh, you want me to empty the dishwasher? Why don't I sweep the floors too? You know what? I'm going to go mow the lawn as well. How about you give me a few more things to do? Can I take any of your chores over? No, because that doesn't happen. Now, it would have just shocked the system a little bit. Can we be better than people expect us to be? Can we be so good that people go, that person is very different. That person has put me in a weird position because they're being so good. And I was trying to actually kind of expose that person and, and I was trying to take advantage of them, but I, I didn't really know what to do because they, they kept just handing me things. They kept doing things for me. This is a tough teaching to live out though. I'm not gonna lie, it, it doesn't always make sense. Because we live in a world that's not fair. We live in a world that's not ideal. And people try to take advantage of us. We live in a world where people are not good. 
And every once in a while, we're going to get into situations where we just, we want to see justice done. We want to, we want to see what's right actually happen in this world. I've had this, this issue with the bank. Uh, I've, I've been with this bank like my whole life. It's where I opened up my first account as a kid. And when I was 18, they said, hey, do you want a credit card? And I was like, yeah, I want a credit card. Um, I am not really responsible enough for a credit card. Be like, yeah, sure, if, if you want to give me one, why not? Let's see what happens. And that's fine. And I did okay with it. But they, I, I noticed, I would notice this line item. Um, it was like a, some insurance thing that they sell you. And I guess I agreed to this when I was 18. And I, I didn't really know what it was. I thought it was something else, but uh, it was something that I didn't actually need. And so one day I realized, like, I don't know what I'm paying for here. And I've had this thing for years and I've seen this thing show up and I, I thought it was one thing, it turned out to be something else. And when I realized what it was, I was like, I never needed this. Why did they, why did they put this on here? Why did they sell this to me? And I, I got really frustrated because it had been this extra charge that I thought was something. And I was like, I didn't need this. This is unfair that they would give this to me. And realistically, I'm probably wrong in the situation, but I was really frustrated. And so I was, I was calling them. I was like, hey, like, what's the deal here? Why would you do this? And what ended up happening was it ended up getting so much more frustrating trying to go through layers and layers and all these circles and, and the depths of their confusing customer service and being told one thing by one person, another thing by another person and being like, this is not fair. This system doesn't make sense. I just want a clear answer and I can't get it. And just being more and more frustrated as I deal with the intricacy and the layers of, of corporations and, and trying to get to the bottom of an issue. It's like, I just want a clear answer. I want, ideally I want them to, what, do, what I feel like would be making it right they're probably not going to. And what I've realized through this process is that I'm, I'm probably just kind of banging my head against the wall. I'm probably upset about something that I don't really need to be. Because it's not even that I'm upset with one person, I'm, I'm just upset with the whole thing. And it's made me frustrated. It's made me a little bitter. And the reality is, I think that Jesus knows that there can also be consequences of seeking revenge. Because if somebody hits us and we hit them back, not only have we stooped to their level, but sometimes in seeking justice, we can't get it right away. And sometimes we may never get it here on earth. And that can lead to a few things. One, I think, is it can lead us to being bitter. Bitterness is an awful thing that can just destroy you from the inside out. Being bitter and never letting go of it can warp your perceptions, it can warp your relationships. Second, it can make us lose out on the joy of regular life. If you carry this burden of injustice or of wanting to see something set right, you can lose out on the joy of living life because you're weighed down by this thing you don't need to be. And Jesus also knows that you might never actually get the revenge or whatever the justice you feel like you seek. And that might frustrate you so much. And fourth, you might have to delay the process of forgiveness. Jesus wants us to be people who forgive so radically. He forgave us and he wants us to do the same for others. But you're just delaying your process of being able to forgive people and if somebody's done something so wrong to you, you may see justice in this world, but can you start with forgiving them? Can you start with forgiveness? This is what Jesus wants. He wants us to actually give burdens to him. He wants us to give the weight that we carry to him and learn how to forgive. This is all part of Jesus saying like, following me is easy. It makes your burden light. 
and it doesn't always make sense, but he wants us to be people who are light, who are free in this world, who are not dragged down by burdens and bitterness. So are we people who seek what we feel like would be justice or can we choose to let go, forgive, and trust that all really will be made right one day? See, through loving everyone, we get to participate in Jesus' work. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this, the cross is the only power in the world which proves that suffering love can avenge and vanquish evil. He's saying the cross, what Jesus did on the cross, that is the only power in the world that proves that love can overtake evil, that love can defeat evil. Jesus overcame evil through the cross. He had the greatest injustice that we can really see in this world. He was an innocent man who was convicted, beat, tortured, and killed. I think we can agree that there's no greater injustice than for an innocent person to be punished for a crime that they did not do. But through all of that, Jesus did not retaliate. He suffered in love, knowing that the people who had captured him, the people who were beating him, the people who were going to ultimately kill him were worth fighting for because Jesus was going to make a way for them to actually experience salvation through grace alone. He was actually atoning for their sins. And he desired to ultimately make peace between God and humanity for all of eternity and stop the chain of evil once and for all. There was so much evil that was done to him, but it did not perpetuate. Jesus put an end to it because he loves us, because he loved those people. And that's our job as well. That's the work that we get to participate in as Christians. Romans 12 verse 21 says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And I know that's not easy. That's really tough to apply. Because sometimes our first response when we get hit is to hit back. And we might be put in situations with people who do not desire to see any good out of, out of their relationship with us. They just want to take advantage. They want to exploit. They want to oppress. So in order to live this out, we must learn to rely on the Holy Spirit to show us how to live. Like John Stott said, there might be no passage that more compels us to need the Holy Spirit to live. So we learn to lead with love. And sometimes that won't make sense, but sometimes it may change hearts around us. And sometimes we might have to remove ourselves from relationships with certain people who are trying to take advantage of us But when we do that, we also fight to forgive them. We fight to move on. We fight against the spirit of bitterness and we fight to just say, you know what? I love that person. I forgive what they did to me, but I'm not going to be around them anymore. That might be the most loving thing that you can do for another person. And Jesus did this um, so well. He overcame evil with good. And just um, to send us on our way, I want to read this whole passage uh, that ends in Romans 12, verse 21. I want to start back at verse 14 and just read this and and just kind of read this over you. Um, This is one of my favorite passages in the Bible because I really... I believe that there's no greater summary in the Bible of how we ought to live as followers of Jesus than this. It's Paul writing in Romans 12, starting at verse 14, he says, bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think you know it all. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. 
For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. Let's pray. Jesus, this is a tough teaching. This is tough to live out. This really shows us why we need the Holy Spirit, because you've actually called us to such a greater way of life that doesn't really make sense in this world. And Jesus, I pray that you would help us to live this out, that when people do wrong against us, that we would respond how you desire for us to respond. That we would know as followers of Jesus what it actually takes to follow you. We would know um, how to live, how to respond, how to be wise. Give us wisdom, God. And for those who are in situations where um, they just so desperately want to see justice carried out, for those who life has been unfair to, who people have been cruel to, I just pray for grace in their lives. I pray for um, the power to forgive, the power to move on, and for ways to um, just escape from, from those that, that try to hurt them. I pray for love to win in, in situations that we find ourselves in. And I pray that we would find strength in knowing that one day you will carry out the justice that we desire to see in this world, that one day your kingdom is coming and all will be made right in this world. And help us to be people of integrity, help us to be people of love, and help us to be people who live in love like you, Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we're glad that you're here. If you're in Winnipeg and you don't have a church, I think we have a great one here. We meet every Sunday, starting next week at 10.30 a.m. That's our summer schedule. Just one service at 10.30 a.m. and our Ukrainian fellowship meets at 2 p.m. But if you're not ever able to join us in person and you watch us from somewhere else online, uh, we're so glad that you're part of our community. We're so glad that you watch every week and um, we will see you back here next week as we continue our series called What Would Jesus Undo? And thanks for joining us. Thanks for being a part of this. And if you ever need anything, you can find all the links to our website and to contact us below. And we love you. God bless you. Have a great week. And we'll see you next time.